Welcome to the Rainy Day Recess Podcast. I am Jamie, one of your on-air hosts, along with Mike, Amanda, Mom, Adrian. We are passionate early learning professionals from the Child Care Resources team who love talking about the issues and current events that affect our daily work with children and families. In this podcast series, we will discuss everything from the joy of play and even what's up with lava lamps to critical race theory, gender stereotyping, and more. Whoever you are, a parent, teacher, coach, or ordinary mortal who simply stumbled upon this podcast, we are happy you're here. Our podcast series is not for the faint of heart, so consider this your one and only warning. We will get serious, we may make you uncomfortable, and our episodes will always be infused with joy and humor. Please join us and become a part of the Rainy Day Recess community. But before we dive into today's topic of conversation, I want to do a quick shout out for the two other members of our Rainy Day Recess team, Rashad Medley and Christina Jacobson, who provide invaluable behind-the-scenes support of this podcast. Recess Podcast. I'm Jamie, one of your on-air hosts, along with Adrian, Amanda, Bob, and Mike. Behind the scenes, we have Rashad and Christina making all the technical magic happen. We are a group of passionate early learning professionals from Child Care Resources who love talking about the issues and current events that affect our daily work with children and families. In this podcast series, we'll be discussing everything from the joy of play, what's up with llama lamps, critical race theory, gender stereotyping, and more. Whoever you are, a parent, teacher, coach, or ordinarily mortal who simply stumbled upon this podcast, we're happy you're here. Fair warning, our podcast is not for the faint of heart. We will get serious, we'll make you a little uncomfortable, but with each episode, there'll be plenty of banner and hopefully some humor. So please join us in our topic today. We will be discussing provider wage and compensation. So on that note, panelists, when we first entered the field, uh, were you at all aware or shocked or did was it apparent the wage floor and wage ceiling in early childhood education is about six inches apart? What was it that made you stay in the early childhood education field? I know for me, I didn't think that it was, um, I was excited about the pay at first. I was kind of young and I was getting paid uh, more than minimum <laughs> wage. And then very quickly as I gained responsibilities and saw my pay stay the same or grow by the most marginal amounts with far more stress and responsibility involved quickly became apparent how small that gap is between director and teacher owner and potentially teacher like there's just not a lot of actual wealth being created uh, in this field i'll pass it to you bob what do you think um well you know when i first entered the field uh well for the first first off um I, I wasn't interested. I So I originally took a parenting class and it was part of a teacher training program and it was advertised as, in a free weekly. And I was the only one who showed up as a parent. Everyone else was already a teacher's assistant. And the, at the end of the program, the director said, you know, there are some places that are hiring. Would you be interested? I said, you know, not really. I already have a job. I was working. I was bartending. Um, she said, well, I already gave your name to someone. So you might receive a phone call. I said, oh, Okay. I took it. I, I I went for the interview just because I was curious to see what the classroom looked like and just to be in the environment. Um, that being said, I ended up taking the job, but I was only able to supplement it because I continued to work on the, as a bartender on the weekends. I could not have afforded to enter this field and support myself and my young child at that time just with what I was making. And so the fact that I stayed in part was because I had other means. Similar to the both of you, um, my situation was that I was actually in a professional field. Um, I was an office manager for a medical clinic, and um, I was paying childcare, um, but my entire paycheck was going to childcare. I could not afford it. And um, so my husband at the time and I had decided that I was going to quit work um, because it, it really did not make financial sense for me to continue working and having our kiddo in daycare from morning till night. 
And um, so I went in to pull him out and they were like, well, why don't you work here? You get a discount. And I was like, ha ha, very funny. You know, it was always loud and uh, chaotic. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. And um, then they told me about, you know, some other benefits that they were offering. Um, and I was like, you know, I always did want to go finish my teaching degree. So um, because they offered uh, college reimbursement and things like that, I was like, this could be a fit. So they asked me three times and I finally um, applied. And and again, I thought I was making decent money. I mean, it was definitely my take home boosted tremendously from not having to pay out the rear end for child care. But um yeah, I mean, like when it came to, I wanted to have another kiddo, you know, it was still just a discount. It still was going to cost me a ton. I wasn't making any more money, but I was going to have to pay more for childcare, which is reality for everybody. Um, but it was just, I realized how little I was making. And then there's all the added responsibilities and then the wax changing and having more requirements for teachers to meet. And um, it just, it never felt like we were in any way compensated for the work and effort that we put in. Um, so it, it, it did take me a little while to figure it out because I was so grateful for being able to actually bring a paycheck home, but um, it caught up with me. I figured it out. <laughs> uh, in my case, I uh, discovered two things very early on in my early learning career. I, um, I jumped into early learning um, while fleeing my first career, which was working in politics, um, politicians, for the most part, are not easy human beings to spend a lot of time around. And I thought, well, young children might be a little bit better. I thought I liked kids. Um, after I decided to give it a try for a year and see, um, see what I thought, I ended up staying in the field. I came to the conviction that there weren't enough men spending time with young children and that, that was a positive I could bring and that I just absolutely loved um, being with young children and knowing I was making a difference that way. But the wages are terrible. They were terrible back then. They're still terrible. I ended up moving into administration and became the director of the child care center where I had begun my life as a toddler teacher and then became a preschool teacher because I couldn't really adequately survive with a child on what I was earning as a teacher and barely making it as a director. Um, I never regretted staying um, in the field. And uh, at the same time, um, I kept waiting for things to get better and eventually realized that they're only going to get better if we fight to make them better and it was going to be a long and difficult struggle, and we're still not there. I had some experience, too, uh, most of you, where um, when I first started, I think, Amy, you said this, when I first started out, I was so excited just to have a paycheck. And actually thought, um, like, it was a good salary, because I didn't know any better. I didn't know, you know, at that time, I wasn't having to completely support myself. Um, I was in college. It was my college job. Um and so I was living on campus. So I was just excited, like, ooh, I have a paycheck, like, every week. And, you know, as life goes on where, you know, circumstances change and you're now supporting yourself, you know, it became very evident that I'm not going to be able to support myself on this um, without making some drastic changes. And I knew that, you know, staying in the field, uh, and I was at the time studying to be a teacher. I knew I wasn't going to be like, you know, having stock options and all of that, but I did expect that I was at least going to be able to pay bills and live reasonably. And reality hit really quick that that is not going to be an option and not having, you know, things like healthcare and, you know, kind of the, the other fringe benefits, you know, retirement plan. Um, those kinds of things were, it, it was very clear. It was going to be a struggle. And yet I stayed. <laughs> We've established that the pay is absolute crap. And that can be taken directly uh, from a headline in the Washington Post back from September in 2021. The pay is absolute crap. Childcare workers are quitting rapidly, a red flag for the economy. So then here we are over 12 months later. Red flags still flapping in gale force winds. Um, 
what are we hearing? What are we seeing in our region that's really, you know, how is this like the landscape pre um, to now post pandemic, heavy air quotes? Uh, what's that look like? As a, I'm sure you're hearing my minor interruption in the background, uh, who's home with me due to this very issue. Um, it does cost way, I make too much for subsidy, it costs too much for care. I'd be paying like Amanda said almost an entire paycheck to have her in full-time in full time care. Um, but the other fun thing that comes out of the staffing crisis and, is the fact that as teachers quit, they shut down classrooms and infant classrooms are one of the first to go. Uh, as you only get a one teacher to four kids uh, ratio, you're gonna take you're gonna take eight kids. Uh, man, you're gonna take eight kids in a toddler or seven kids in a toddler classroom or ten kids in a preschool classroom versus keeping one of the open kids. The more teachers you lose, the more likely it is that those infant spaces are gone. And again, from personal experience, I was getting wait lists for her uh, still that were when she would not need that classroom anymore. So. Very wild um, to see how just not losing um, teachers and not being able to pay and then finding different avenues to work uh, when we were in the pandemic has really led to just a lack of classroom. I feel like building off of what you said, I you know, obviously um, the cost of care is one thing. We can't raise the cost of care for parents any more than it is, but how are we going to pay people more if we don't raise the cost of care? Um, when and especially when people have two or three children, it makes more sense to have a nanny. It just makes more sense economically than to pay for three children in care. How do how do we reconcile that? Um, and then, you know, I, I think as far as what are we seeing 12 months later or, or 12 months plus? Um, yes, that staffing continues to be an issue. And then it's that dual staffing versus enrollment. Like you said, they um, and we're talking about classrooms that are empty, classrooms that are available with materials that are set up ready for Ooh. children. But if they can't hire teachers, then they can't, then, and they have wait lists. There are children ready to go in that classroom. Mm-hmm. But again, if they can't hire teachers, and then the thing you hear over and over is, I can't pay as much as McDonald's. I can't pay as much as Taco Bell. Um, so then the question becomes, well, what value can you add that you're not, that someone's not going to get at Taco Bell? What kind of maybe professional development or what, because you, maybe you're never going to be able to pay more. This is such a hot topic for me. I, this, this. You know, in 2019, I was a director and um, I, I joined an advocacy group um, to go to the Olympia and to start talking to legislators, asking for them to um, fund the career and wage ladder and get our teachers uh, recognized, pay for what they're doing um, because they are teachers. They are, We are asking uh, just as much, if not more, in some ways as teachers in traditional K through five or K through 12 schooling. and you know, there's, um, you know, different, of course, levels of complication, difficulties, and things like that within each role. Um, So I'm not saying one is is more or less than the other, but it's, it's, there is so much responsibility placed on childcare workers, and they are not being paid more than, as you said, Bob, a Taco Bell employee. Um, You get better benefits at Starbucks than you do any childcare provider that I know. and unfortunately, teachers and or sorry, t-shirts and water bottles are not the incentive, you know, child care directors think they are. Um, they're fun, but they are not compensating for a lack of a livable wage. And you know, participating in programs like early achievers where you will get uh increased subsidy reimbursements, um, and there are you know, tiered awards and things like that, that you can qualify for and, and grants and things of that nature that you have access to, it helps. Um, but then you look at the crisis of, of not having materials for these children. So the, the children get the materials over the staff getting the, the bonuses and things of that nature. It is such a catch-22. There is just so many um, struggles for child care providers to, A, maintain staffing, um, and, and then B, to pay them uh, what they deserve and keep the doors open. And, you know, one of the philosophies I bought into and held firm as a director is that if my staff was taken care of, then everything else would come because the te- the children would be happy, the parents would be happy, um, retention would be good. Um, but when teachers are not paid well, then everything falls to crap. You know, the, the children have inconsistency. They are going through 
struggles day after day. Parents are frustrated. They might leave because their favorite teacher left and the center or, or program is constantly playing ch- catch up, trying to uh, backfill the staff. And every time you hire new staff, it costs an arm and a leg. Every time you lose children and have to recruit to get more children, it costs an arm and a leg. So is the answer just to start paying our teachers what they are worth and take that financial hit in the beginning so that we aren't losing teachers and aren't losing families and we're able to sustain a uh, more equitable um, long-term presence uh, uh, for finance. Um, I think I said equitable and I meant economical. I apologize. But um, the, uh, it, it just, it really ruffles my feathers and I don't know the answer, but we need, we need help. Yeah. We just interrupt and lean in on that, Amanda, the, about, you mentioned the grants and being able to apply for those. Everybody loves $500 they didn't have in their pocket, but that does not compensate for uh, being able to put that into a retirement fund or being able to put that towards a medical procedure or something. That's just not enough. That's like maybe a third of my rent. That does, that's a great gift, um, but it's definitely not going to sustain or do anything um, to like compensate for the things that you're missing, uh, not having benefits like that. A couple of numbers that, that really matter um, and pertain to all of this. One of them is that a very recently released study Um, shows that there are 90,000 fewer child care workers nationally than there were in February 2020. So the nationally, and the trend is probably across most, if not all states, the number of child care workers is actually dropping, even while the number of folks looking for care is increasing. The first thing, if if you acknowledge that we have a a staffing crisis, and because of that staffing crisis, we have a availability of care crisis for families, then the first thing you'd wanna do is at least stabilize or protect what you've already got. Um, And then you would go about trying to systematically grow the supply. I think those are two separate, they're related, but they're two separate issues. And our state with um, adoption of the Fair Start for Kids Act in 2021 is taking some concrete steps to try to stabilize um, programs. But even if a program hasn't closed, and we know that um, at least 20,000 programs nationally have closed in the last couple of years, your program might be open, but you might have a couple of rooms. You might be operating a child care center with a couple of rooms that are currently not open because you don't have staff um, to fill them. Or, you're, or you have a room that's open, but because of staffing shortages, you're operating at under your license capacity for that room. Um, those are things that don't so readily show up in the big statistics, but they really matter. In the end, I think all of this comes down to M-O-N-E-Y. Um, net. Compared to other countries, uh, the United States invests remarkably little in early care and learning. Um, we invest, um, we invest um, at the national level, we invest 0.3, three tenths of 1% of federal funds are going to early learning. That's one fifth the amount in Sweden. That's one fourth the amount in France. That's one third the amount in Republic of Korea. We lag behind every other uh, major developed country in this regard. Um, even if we do everything we can at the state and local level, I'm not sure it's enough to make up for the lack of the um, federal investment. It was interesting is that we had a, a child care crisis well before the pandemic, but a lot of focus has been on the, the pandemic causes and what's kind of the, the fallout from that. But we had a crisis well before that, where there are places, um, you know, in the state of Washington, where um, in some of the more rural areas, where there might be one child care provider in a county. Um, infant care, Jamie, you mentioned this, has always been a struggle and a stretch because it is a higher cost program um, classroom to run. And, you know, the article you talked about at the very beginning, you know, is from 2021. And I read yesterday where there's a center, I can't remember where, but they have, you know, they sent a message to their parents on a Sunday that said, we're closed until we can hire like three teachers and three assistants. And until we have those 
people in place, we can't operate. And to think, yeah, there's classrooms that are just sitting empty, waiting for children to arrive, but there isn't the staffing there for it. And the economy of that, um, you know, we're, we're asking a lot of our teachers, we're asking a lot more and more of our teachers. And I think part teachers have just said, I can't do it. And I need a livable wage. And I'm not willing to sacrifice my personal family anymore, or my personal needs for a career. You know, there's some who see it as a career or profession. And there's some who enter as it's because it's a job. And, and, you know, it, that's the reality of our situation. You know, we talk about like fast food restaurants or other jobs that frankly, in a lot of ways, ask for a lot less in terms of requirements on going professional development um, are perhaps not as stressful or stressful in very different ways. But it's a living wage. It's not just weight. It's not just raising salaries or and but it's having a living wage. And for me, being here in Seattle in King County, it is horribly expensive, you know, to get to a living wage. Um, I mean, a few years ago, it was considered $70,000 was considered a livable wage. That was a few years ago. That is not the case anymore. And so, you know, if we want to retain our teachers and keep them, which leads to a better quality of care, continuity of care for children so they're not having a revolving door of adults in their lives, it's a bigger systems issue that, you know, yes, $500 bonus here or there is nice. You know, recognize that you worked hard during the pandemic. That is nice. But it's it's not the recognition. The recognition really comes in a living wage. That's going to lead to retention. That's going to lead to better outcomes for kids. Um, adults, uh, kids being able to or families actually being able to find childcare um, and perhaps reduce some of the, the wait list because the offset, the side of that is kids being in care that may not be quality, may not be the best for them. Families having to make tough decisions about their own employment um, based on where their children are or are not. And if families are stressed about where their child is, they're not then able to be the best employee that they can. Absolutely. And I really, uh, I really thought that there's a, something to be said that was mentioned earlier. Um, I think it was by Amanda about this, the extra requirements as the wax have changed uh, throughout the last few years. I know that I've seen them um, go from very basic requirements to much stricter. There's been confusion in the, re in the requirements. There's been a lot of deadlines that have been pushed back. Um, technically like I've been in this industry my entire 20s I just don't have the ECE credits um and it's hot like and I went in order to balance that with the hours I was working I didn't start working on those until I was at child care resources uh because that this has been the only job I had enough stability in with hours to be able to dedicate some time for that um so what do, what do you guys think do you think the educational requirements uh are holding back being able to recruit some you know, additional teachers and staff? Um, I, I, well, I'm personally torn on this. I think, um, you know, you would, I think you, Jamie, had talked about, you know, like recognition and, and professionalizing this field, which I think is so important. But I think we put a lot of emphasis on that piece of paper, I think. And especially when you're talking about the ECE is, and I hate to say this, but it is the least return on your investment that you can get for any college degree that is available. You, you, you are guaranteed coming out of it and getting paid less than you're going to get paid for any college level degree. And so until that changes, I think requiring teachers to get those degrees, I, I think there is a reason to question that. That being said, I think, and this also goes back to, I think we, had, Mike, you had mentioned there are sort of two tracks. There's the retention of the, the, the staff that we have, but also the, the recruitment and the training. And I think all of you know, and we've all worked in programs, there's a specific chain, corporate chain, and I won't mention them by name, but literally every time you go in as a coach, the entire staff has changed. And I'm 
shocked that they run their business model like that only because of, like you said, Amanda, how expensive it is to recruit and train new people. You would think they would invest a little bit more, but I also don't think people know what or how to invest. And so, for instance, if you can pay for someone to just shadow someone else for a week, you don't throw them into a classroom on their first day because they're a warm body and you need a warm body in that classroom, but you pay them to shadow someone else, a professional who knows what they're doing, and you pay that professional a mentor's wage, um, then maybe that person is going to stay a little bit longer because they don't feel, because I mean, I'm going to go back to my own personal experience. That's another thing that it's kind of amazing that I lasted in this field. I was terrible. When I started, that first teacher that I worked with was shocked that I had just come from a training program, which was a great program as far as like philosophy and high level, but hadn't prepared me at all for the realities of behavior management. And so I, I, but I, I had to kind of work things out by myself, read things on the side, but people don't put that investment. They just give up. They think I'm terrible at this and they quit. And that has nothing to do with what, how much they're paid or they're not. They just, they, you know, and so I think in investing at the beginning has value. Um, yes, yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. Um, I agree wholeheartedly. And I'm, I'll am all throw in a, a little personal tidbit as well. Uh, I, too, was an absolute crap teacher. Um, I was what I would, I've always felt that I, I'm a good parent. I feel like I am nurturing. I always wanted children. I wanted to be a teacher, like I mentioned. Um, but putting me in a toddler classroom with zero experience, zero education, telling me it was going to be, you know, easy job and then getting in there and having to change diapers every two hours or more uh, while leading a curriculum, while doing um, name to face checks every, you know, 30 minutes or at all transitions, uh, keeping the room clean, putting children down for nap. Oh, hurry up and giving them a nap so you could take a lunch break because this was before the whack changed that you could not break each other for lunch. And all of these requirements. And I was terrible. I could not keep up. It took me a solid year until I had a flow. And I will admit, in my first two months of working there, I left a child outside unattended, almost got fired. And, you know, there was there was no consideration for the fact that I was inexperienced, poorly trained, had no support. And it was one of those terrifying situations. And I agree with you. There needs to be some additional support getting into that role. There needs to be that great onboarding and truth transparency in what the role is going to entail. And I will tell you, one of the things that really boosted my confidence was taking the child care basics class. And at the time it was the um, in-person one. And I just got so much from that in learning about brain development and, hey, these toddlers are not out to give me a bad day. They are just living their life. And I need to figure out, you know, like a puzzle where things fit so that I can have them have a successful day and, and not go home crying and pulling my hair out. And, you know, it's it's no wonder that people have burnout. And if I didn't have that have to work mentality to keep my child in care, um, you know, if I didn't have to be there, if it was not a, a, a need situation, I wouldn't have. I hated it. It was miserable. And um, so when... Yeah, when when I was able to get some more formal education, it really things started to click into place for me. So I do support people getting educated. I do not support the requirements necessarily as they sit. Um, but I do really appreciate the um, adaptable uh, offerings and the equivalents that have been supported. Because again, I think that that the information being offered is critical to great classroom management and understanding children and how they work and tick and everything else. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot that we're asking. And if I could jump back in just very quickly, I think the other thing, you know, that we don't talk about new to new staff about is a professional development path, which is something that you can't offer really at Taco Bell. Yes, we can offer you these trainings We and you can move forward. This is a career and people don't hear that have, have, you don't hear about that. You don't have that um, option. And I size up where we are with uh, Tom's staffing and availability of care crises. Uh, really, it's the same crisis, but two different aspects or faces of it. Um, I'm I'm struck by I'm struck by the fact that even though money isn't always enough to solve problems, it sure helps a lot. Money lubricates your efforts a whole lot. Um, most most of the things that we need to do, I think, are actually pretty clear. Um, let us imagine, for example, that the state of Washington 
um, uh, uh, legislators and governors saw fit to subsidize childcare workers' wages. We know that would make a huge difference, but it would take dollars. Or to offer um, another example, um, our state is providing some reasonably decent supports to providers who are um, going back to or staying in school, um, trying to complete certific certificate programs or get a, a degree in the field. I think that's a good thing. At the same time, um, it could be done in a um, it could be done in a much more comprehensive way, and we also have to recognize that we have to increase support for programs in our two and four year colleges in the state if we expect um, if we expect to um, be able to ramp up the number of folks in the field who are getting that education. So I don't think the education requirements per se are a bad thing. It's how you go about them. One other thing I'll mention: it's slightly it's all of the stuff I think is so interconnected. Um, but here, specifically in King and Pierce counties, more so than anywhere else in the state, we have a red hot economy that has only slightly slowed in the last couple of months, is still supercharged, and we have a really high cost of living. Let's imagine that we were going to talk about growing care. Um, how how can most how can most people who might be think having the foolish idle thought, hmm, I'd like to open up an early learning program? Where are they going to do that? Um, if you're a family home provider or you're thinking of becoming a family home provider, that's one thing. But even then, you might be having a hard time making ends meet in much of King or Pierce counties to just keep your keep your home to begin with. And if you're trying to open an early learning program, um, oh, my goodness, you're really facing some some challenges. Where are you going to find the space to do this? Where are you going to find the money to do the extensive rehabilitation of that space? Where are you going to find the money to meet all the other requirements besides education requirements that go into owning and operating an early learning program? I think the whole question of, of licensing requirements um, should be revisited. And I say this, I, I say it with trepidation because our state has some of the best early learning licensing standards in the country. At the same time, um, we should be thinking about which one, which ones of these are really essential and which ones of these are not. Because if I'm thinking about operating an early learning program or opening one up, um, and I look at all the things that I'm required to do, I may just put my hands up and say, well, it's a it's an unsustainable business model to begin with. And then the upfront costs and the costs of continuing to meet certain requirements are just crazy even if I think in principle that they're a good idea. So I think we should be trying to, re I really hate saying this, but I think we should be trying to reduce regulations in a smart way. So that doesn't mean going the route of states like Idaho and Texas, where you have a lot of legislators who are pushing to do away with um, minimum ratio um, requirements. Um, but it does mean looking at all the other auxiliary stuff and saying, hmm, for instance, maybe we don't have to enforce, maybe we don't have to require X number of parking spaces if that's a deal killer and this person's not going to open a program. Or maybe we can offer, maybe we can offer grants, not loans, offer one time, say, we can identify um, programs that are going to be opening in childcare deserts, which are disproportionately areas that are serving um families of color and low income folks. And we can say, if you'll open up a program in this geographic area, we will give you um, $75,000 or $100,000 towards meeting the cost of getting that program up and going. Um, anyway, just a, a couple of ideas, um, but I think we should be thinking bold, not um, timid, if we are gonna have any hope of um, addressing this crisis. I too am torn about, um, you know, our requirements and like Bob said, the return on the requirements. And I think we, we have to look at there's many right ways and not, you know, education. Yes. But what are the ways that education can be achieved or professional development? Um, you know, the research, where does the research actually say 
You know, is it a BA is where you really get the best for kids? Is it an AA? Is it professional de- ongoing professional development? Like where really is that line? And is it a four-year degree? Um, is a start. Something we haven't talked about is that the fact that a good portion of the teachers and staff that are in um, child care programs, licensed child care programs, so we're not talking to part-day preschool programs, um, but the child licensed child care programs that perhaps accept a subsidy are staffed by primarily women and women of color. And there's a there's an equity piece of this of keeping those wages low, um, whether it's intentional or not. Um, we're not providing equity in our world and in our in our society by keeping a certain population of women of particularly women of color at lower wages, um, and that includes things you know looking beyond someone starting the field, but also being able to retire from the field and leave the field. Um, I've had conversations with, you know, teachers and directors and family child care providers where they're ready to leave the field. Their body, they're tired. Their bodies are tired because let's be honest, being in child care is physically demanding. The lifting of kids, carrying um, up and down off the floor, um, uh, you know, sitting on the floor, not all things that are good for our bodies over a long period of time. And they want to retire, but they have nothing to retire on. And so they're staying in the field much longer than they want to. And that's also something we have to be willing to look at is not just as people want to enter the field and how we are supporting them, but providing opportunities for people to actually retire and leave the field and not in a, you know, putting themselves at risk um, physically, mentally, socially, and not, and then not putting kids at risk at the same time. Yeah. Adrian, I wanted to comment early on that school that you'd mentioned, like what a brave, I strongly respect the stance they took in breaking down. Like we could just keep, our doors open and it could be a non not quality environment. It could be potentially uh, a hazard. I could, we could be burning out all of our staff and then you, we won't have, you know, we'll just be in the same crisis. Um, I really do respect that they made that stance as we're trying to work through this absolutely ridiculous crisis around paying people um, a, a, a livable wage. And I'll, before we jump into our last prompt that you mentioned, Adrian, around women of color and this being, you know, whether it's on purpose or not, a low paying, low paying field. Um, it reminded me of a comment when I first started working with uh, youth and this wasn't in Washington state, but I had received a comment from a group of friends that I was out with that, oh, do you have a boyfriend or a husband? Because that's a wife's job. As and then I asked them to elaborate, and they're like, "Well, we we kind of assume most teachers or childcare workers have a partner because that's the kind of job that you wouldn't you do as like a side job." Wow, that is a really interesting like the, like that it was just assumed in the wage that you had a partner that was going to be making more to subsidize the fact that you couldn't do it on your own with that money, like openly acknowledged. So, I. Didn't, I think there's a lot of perspectives change that we need to have around that to not treat something, um, to not look at a position as anything less than uh, as enough to sustain an individual while they're working and professionalizing their life. Um, so with that, uh, we've got one last little question I'd love to run by you guys and get some potentially, uh, Mike mentioned bold, some big bold recommendations we'd want to see coming out of the Washington State Child Care Collaborative Task Force. Uh, for listeners who don't know, this was created in Washington State. A uh, legislator was passed in 2019, and this child care task force has been coming together to create a report um, from providers telling legislators uh, what the cost of quality is to provide child care in the state. Um, so what, what are, not seeing the report yet, we'll get it soon, but what are some recommendations that were uh, we'd like to see come out of this to help soften the edges of the childcare uh, staffing crisis. 
I know for me, I'm team like open infant classrooms, make the infant reimbursement more equitable. Um, so that's a big, big recommendation for me uh, is that that infant and toddler reimbursement rate needs to actually match the amount of effort it takes to deal um, with toddlers and infants. I'll only slightly disagree with you, Amanda, that I, I heard that toddlers are not out to make your day hard. I'm not sure I believe that anymore, having a toddler of my own. Um, but I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate their individuality and they're tough. They're tough. And the teachers who are willing to be toddler teachers day in, day out, um, they deserve, they deserve that respect and to be getting compensated appropriately. So I know that I'm sending my child to a quality caregiver. It definitely depends on the toddler. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I do want to say just, okay. So back to. Um, I, to sort of wrap up for me, the education piece, I think back to Adrian's question of, you know, there are lots of ways to, to offer professional development. Is a four-year degree the right way? For me, is is a four-year degree even the timing? Again, when you need, you need that information your first 30 days, that's not going to help you in, you know, so that's part of it. And then the other piece, just back to the, because we've used the word professionalism a couple of times. It's a very loaded term. We're not going to get into that. But I think part of when we say professionalism, for me, it means acknowledging and accepting and, and honoring the, the wisdom people already have and come with and the people that, the, the wisdom that comes from experience, not just from the classroom and all that. So that's all that I want to say about that. As far as what do we want to see and what do we need to see? Um, I want to give a shout out to a colleague who is currently working on their doctorate, which is uh, studying whether two and four year programs offered in multiple languages in people's home languages will increase the field, will increase people staying in the field, retention and all that. And then that's, um, I think that's a really powerful consideration. Um, as far as staff retention, I, you know, I don't know what the big picture, what the system will say and what we look at, but I, when I talk to directors, so some of the things we shouted out, you know, I think a one-time bonus is, is it's not the best, but it's better than nothing if that's what you can offer. T-shirts and water bottles, I don't want to completely discount them because I, you know, I, I it, again, it's not that they're better than nothing. If you can create a climate where people want that water bottle, where that logo means something, then that t-shirt actually does mean something. And that, so to me, without adding any more funds, what kind of culture and climate do you create for your program? I think, um, what does your break room look like? Is it sort of a storage room where there are these boxes and things and people are shoved in the corner? Or is this a nice place where people are going to want to spend an hour a day? Um, is it right next to the classroom so they can still hear the children screaming? Or if you have this place, can you put it somewhere else? Um, do you put magazines and things in there? I mean, again, not to focus on a break room, but that's just one example of how uh, it, you, it doesn't cost money, but you can create. And again, back to the climate and culture. Do you have a climate of trust among your teachers do, or do you have a climate of competition? When someone needs to be sent home because you are at very low ratios, do you create a competitive situation or do you have an equitable way of managing that? Um, if babysitting, do you, do you have really restrictive babysitting law rules in your program or do you actually support and allow and encourage teachers to make that extra funds on the weekend? And how do you, um, you know, all those things I think are things that we can do now without paying more money, um, but it takes creativity and, and oh, yeah. I'm going to agree with you, Bob. I, I completely agree. And I'll tell you what. Um, this cost of quality survey, when it does come out, if it does increase wages, um, if the, the recommendation is made that the, the um, reimbursement rate for subsidy is increased, then it will be a win, right? We'll celebrate it. We'll be happy that it happened. It's still not going to be enough until early learning can be funded and and subsidized through the state for all children so that no parent is is paying more than 7% of their wages to childcare um so that their child has an opportunity to at that early learning quality programming um so that they're not having to send it to um their child to you know just a neighbor who's willing to babysit for well below um minimum wage um that that neighbor might be planning the kiddo in front of uh, the TV or, um, you know, not really know anything about early childhood. And, and then we're sending children to kindergarten behind schedule and, you know, we're having to help them catch up. And, and it takes a long time. It could take three years for a child to close that education gap. And so when we put such an emphasis on quality of early learning care, 
we have to fund the quality of early learning care. We have to make it worthwhile for people to be in this industry and to give their all and to give the their their lives, you know, taken away from their time and their family and their health and their well-being and their their energy and feed it into the children because they take and they take and they take and what they give back is not enough to sustain us, as Adrian pointed out. Um, and you know, one of the things that I recommended in a peer group yesterday um, is that providers think more about their staff as family and treat them well. And mirroring what Bob said, it we are in a relationship-based industry. And without great relationships, without people to, without giving the, the staff someone to come to when they've had a hard day without someone to give them a break when they feel like they're going to scream in the middle of the classroom, you know, without these emotional supports in place, we are going to create burnout, whether the funding is there or not. So I I mirror everything Bob says. And I just want to say we are still so, so, so far from creating a system that will truly benefit this workforce economically. And I hope that there's a great recommendation that comes from the governor um, that, that, that can, you know, help give us that, that fight and that burn for another year. So then, you know, carrying into the next uh, legislative session, you know, we'll have something to be excited about and, um, but it's going to be a fight. It's forever going to be a fight. This is not over. (laughs) Jamie, Bob, Amanda, you've all lifted up some really important, aspects of the situation. If I'm thinking about big and bold, um, two things come to my mind, especially. One of them is one of them is to map the state, do it zip code by zip code or um, by some other means, but map the state and for the first time have the state uh, identify not only how much care is available within a particular geographical area, let's, I'm just using zip codes for convenience at the moment, it could be some other division, but, um, and how much care do we actually need to have within that zip code? So you're, you're going to find um, in most areas, not all, you're going to find an imbalance between supply and what you need, but it requires the state to say, if we need X number of spaces and we only and we're only 50% of the way there in the zip code, what do we do about it? Um, sure, there are things that would help across the board around the state, such as, um, let's imagine it as a thought experiment, if um, the um, reimbursement rate for Working Connections Child Care was 100% of the actual cost of care. Um, that would be fantastic. But we, um, this gets to the, this gets to the fact that we also have to increase the supply of care, and I, I even though we're even though we're talking right now about how do we just keep the damage from getting worse, we have to be simultaneously be thinking about once we've stabilized the system, which is still inadequate, how do we grow it? And the other big recommendation I would have is to think holistically. We should we should remember that licensed. Um, licensed early care and learning is only is only supporting about 20 percent of the young children in the state. Um, we have to think about family friend and neighbor care, for instance, and how we can improve um, uh, what the support for family friend and neighbor care is, even though there's a little bit of support in the First Start for Kids Act for family friend and neighbor, it's a good a good first step. That's all it is, is a first step. But we should be thinking about how do we ensure that every child and every family are, that they're all getting the support that they need. And so what we need to improve the situation in licensed child care, which is genuinely a crisis. And we have to recognize that licensed child care is an essential part of the solution. It's not the entire solution. And if we're thinking holistically, I just have this feeling that we're ultimately going to be a little bit better off. Oh, one big idea. Um, just one. <laughs> um, you know, I it's I'm going to come back to and something I've said before, which is everything should be based on living wage, a livable wage, and not just we can't just raise salaries, but we have to raise salaries where it's a living wage that someone isn't because they work in the 
early learning field or with children or youth is essentially subsidizing the field and subsidizing care because that's what's happening. When you keep the wages, when the wages are low, there it, it is being subsidized. It's being subsidized by the person who works in it. And we can't just pass that on to families because families are also in a breaking point and, and the cost of living. Um, but really that focus on what is the dollar amount it's going to take um, to get us to living livable wages and looking at the various industries and fields and businesses that are not carrying their weight in terms of paying taxes, uh, whether it's property tax, business tax, you know, whatever it is, you know, we have large businesses in the state of Washington who are making incredible amounts of money, but are not paying their fair share of taxes. And that is less revenue that's available to help support raising. Um, and they are in part reason why the cost of living is so high in parts of Washington state, particularly King and Pierce, Seattle, the larger, um, larger populated areas. You know, the cost of living here, you know, when milk is at five plus dollars a gallon, um, we have to look at the kind of the holistic picture. I have a whole other list of stuff, but I'll stop at the one. <laughs> Thank you guys. I will wrap us up here with thanking our audience so much for joining us here at Rainy Day Recess Podcast. We hope that you've enjoyed, been inspired by, and hopefully learned a little bit from our content today. If you have any questions that you would like to discuss on, uh, like us to discuss on air, please submit any questions or uh, topic ideas to ccpodcast at childcare.org, or sorry, ccrpodcast at childcare.org, or please reach out directly to us or your coach. Next topic, we will be discussing advocacy as we gear up for our legislative session. So please, again, uh, stay tuned for that. We look forward to hearing from you. We here at the Rainy Day Recess Podcast hope you have enjoyed, been inspired by, and learned from our content today. Please submit any questions you'd like us to discuss on air to ccpodcast at childcare.org. If you'd like any more information on what you've heard today, please reach out to us directly or contact your host.